I was just a shepherd boy without a shield, without a sword. Fed up with the giant's voice, screaming curses to the Lord. I walked down the hill alone with a pocket full of river stones. But what the Philistine couldn't see is what I had was more than me. See, on my own, I'm weak, but my God fights for me. That night I fell asleep Till morning came To shock and all Cause my God Fight for me Oh yes I did I stumbled into the room With alabaster and my wound I could feel the judging eyes As I knelt before the cross I poured my oil upon his feet I didn't care who saw me weep I gave him all I had that day And he should have sent me on my way But instead he lifted up my head Cause my God fight for me Oh yes he does He's my shield Isn't that a great way to start worshiping God today? He is a God who loves us and cares about us, and let's continue to proclaim him with this call to worship. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Well, it's great to be with you. My name is Josh Kiesling, and I am the new Care and Connections pastor, and it's been great getting to know you over the last few weeks, and I look forward to getting to know you more. One of the things that I am passionate about that I want you to know about is that I believe God calls us to be connected, hence my job title, um, but also that you are known, known by him and known by each other. God desires to know you personally and to know us. And so hear these words of this prayer this morning. God of unfailing light, in your realm of glory, the poor are blessed, the hungry are filled, and every tear is wiped away. Strengthened by this vision, may we follow in the ways of holiness that your son may known in earth, in, in life, and through death. Amen. Will you stand and greet one another with Jesus Christ's peace? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I just, it was, a, it was a mistake. It 
It was not a choice. It was an accident. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh. Brothers and sisters, today the church worldwide remembers and celebrates All All Saints Sunday. This is a day that's set aside to remember the apostles, the martyrs, um, heroes of the faith, the ordinary people who have displayed God's extraordinary grace in their lives. Um, And in a few moments later in the service, we're gonna remember those from our own congregation who have passed away in this last year. But the entire set, uh, the entire musical set this morning is designed to point us towards God as a global, historic, communal people. And so let's join our voices together and remember the God who is faithful throughout the generations and throughout the world. Tu
congregation who have passed away this last year. And for some, um, these faces, they might be close friends or loved family members. And for others in this room, they may be absolute strangers. But the power of belonging to the family of God doesn't rest in our proximity or our familiarity alone. Rather, it rests in the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. So as you see these faces of people from our congregation, would you give God thanks for their lives? Give God thanks for the ways that they have demonstrated his grace, the ways that they have lived out the image of Christ and pray for the families who are still mourning. Look to the screens together. and sisters who have faithfully showed us, shown us your love and your grace. Comfort their families as they mourn, for we know that you are close, near to the brokenhearted. You lift up those who are crushed in spirit. God, thank you for the legacy of your church, belonging to a family that is much larger than any one of us, and yet we are called your sons and your daughters. God, as we continue responding to you, fill us with your faith and your love so that we can share that with the world. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's continue responding to our God together.
Today we celebrate with God as Jacob, Micah, and Mason become united with God's Son, Jesus Christ, and his church through the sacrament of baptism, and as Caleb confirms God's grace received when he was baptized as an infant. In baptism, your Adam identity dies, and you are raised into a new life, the humanity of Jesus Christ, receiving the fullness of God's grace so that you may faithfully bear his image and name for the rest of your lives. Baptism binds your identity to God and his church. When you rejoice, we rejoice. 
when you mourn, we mourn. And together, with all those baptized before you, you are expected to live a life worthy of the family name of Jesus Christ. You're expected to continue in the apostles' teaching, the fellowship of Christ's church, breaking bread at his table and prayer. You're expected to resist evil, and if you ever do fall into sin, to repent and return to the Lord. You're expected to proclaim the good news in word and example, and to love all people as yourself, striving for God's justice and peace among all, respecting the dignity of every person. To help you do this, God gives you his spirit, who guides into all truth. This is the baptismal life. So as a way for us to commit to this life and affirm that there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, let us, as one church, proclaim our faith together by saying the Apostles' Creed. Please join me. We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you believe all this, say, yes, I believe it. Thanks be to God. Church, uh, when these baptisans come out of the water, you'll hear me introduce them as sister or brother. And as our family grows, we must commit ourselves uh, to this. These are new brothers and sister. There may be times in their future uh, when they are wounded or empty or wandering or even lost. So church, do you commit to pursue them, to diligently nourish them with goodness and faithful love? to guide them to the right path by the example of your own life and to intentionally protect and comfort them? If so, say, we will. Thanks be to God. God, um, you used water and spirit to bring forth the first creation, to cleanse your creation in the flood, to deliver your people from the Egyptians, to heal Naaman in the Jordan, and in that same river to bring forth the second creation and the humanity of Jesus Christ. And so, Holy Spirit, today, make this water your water. Sanctify it so that in the same way, it will cleanse and deliver and heal and recreate these, your beloved, as they continue to live in the everlasting life of your Son. The evil one has no claim on them. They're your children, and they bring you great joy. With this water, cultivate the soil of their life so that they can produce only the fruit of your spirit. Use their life, God, as a channel of your kingdom, making what is often unseen, seen through the ways that they live from this point on. It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. Uh, Mason, and he's joined by his mom, Jody. Mason, I invite you to testify to God's grace in your life. Hi, my name is Mason Quick, and I am nine years old. I used to live in not that good of a home. I met Brian and Jody, and they invited me to church, and it was the best day of my life. At church, I came to learn and believe in Jesus and worship him. Today, I want to be baptized because I know Jesus would want me to follow the, to, would want me to follow 
and I want to be obedient to Jesus. Amen. Nathan, Eli, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are now dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. Welcome, Brother Nathan. Next, we have Jacob Vardaman, and he's accompanied by his dad, Jeremy. Jacob, I invite you to testify to God's grace in your life. When I was six years old, I asked Jesus into my heart. Today, I want to get baptized for a few reasons. One reason is is that I want to step out of my comfort zone and be less shy to talk about Jesus. Also, I want others to know I am a child of God and I want to join my family and friends who are following Jesus. My parents have always loved me and been kind uh, to me and shown me God's love. My brother Micah and cousin Michael love me by inviting me to do things with them. Jesus has been with my family in difficult times. We had worked into our house and stayed in our cabin for a few days. God gave my dad a new job, and I want I want to thank God for always being with me. And I <clears throat> and I want Him to help me be more be more nice and patient with others. Kelly, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You're now dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. Micah Schmitz, and she's accompanied by her friend, Cami Malden. Oh, <laughs> you made it. <laughs> Micah, I invite you to testify to God's grace in your life. Before giving my life to Christ, I was living a life of sin. I placed my identity in studies, work, and achievements. I struggled with selfishness, pride, and judgment of others. God was not at the center of my life. Today, I'm excited to share that my identity is now rooted in Christ. Over time, he has worked on my heart and changed my selfishness to a desire to serve, my judgment for, to a love for others, and my pride for obedience to God. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He is at the center of my life, and I have decided to trust, to trust and obey him. I have found freedom in him, and I want to commit my life to him completely. Hmm. Amen. Micah Noel, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're now dead to sin. Oh, in Christ Jesus. Caleb, we praise God that his grace is not dependent on our ability to understand it, and that even as an infant, you are welcomed into his family through baptism. Today, we celebrate with you as you publicly affirm that baptism, so I invite you to testify to God's grace in your life. I've been going to church all my life. As a little kid, I got bored at church. When I was five years old, we went to the Christmas Eve service and read about the big lie when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and brought sin into the world. That story sparked my interest, so I wanted to learn more about Jesus. When I came home, I started to worry about that lie. I was very upset. My parents told me about Jesus coming to the, into the world, forgiving our sins, and throwing that lie away. That made me feel better. Then I wanted Jesus to come into my life. Now Jesus helps me when I'm stressed and washes my worries away. I'm very thankful for what God has done for me and all he has given me. A Bible passage that helps me is Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, which says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, 
with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up this shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. <sighs> take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. I was baptized as a baby at my church in Georgia, and today I'm giving my testimony to declare that I'll follow Jesus and trust in him all my life. Today, in the presence of God and his congregation, I affirm the identity and the role God gave me by spirit and baptism. I am a part of Christ's royal priesthood, invited to participate with him in cultivating his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. I confirm my rejection of the evil one, his works, and his ways. And I confirm my intent to faithfully gather with God's people and to be sent, bearing God's name to the world in faith, word, and deed. Amen. Thanks be to God. Yep. Right there. Have you, Neil? you caught that he did all that by memory, didn't you? <laughs> Let's pray together as a church over Caleb. Gracious Lord, through water and the spirit, you have made Caleb your own. You forgave him all his sins and brought him newness of life. Continue to strengthen him with your Holy Spirit to daily bear the fruit of your grace. May love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control flourish in every place that he goes in his conversations, in his silence, when he's with others, when he's alone, when he's working, when he's resting. May his entire life be a doorway to the kingdom of God. May it be on earth as it is in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our brother and Lord, amen. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you gather with us. We thank you that you delight to be with your people. And Lord, we give you all blessing and honor, praise and thanks to you, because you are the God of our salvation. You are the one who walks with us and through many things. You are the God who always has our back. And so Father God, today as we celebrate what you have been doing and are continuing to do, through the life of not just our church, but the global church throughout history. Lord, thank you for showing up. And Lord, we ask your blessing on those that are in our community that are hurt, that are going through pain and going through recovery. Lord, those who have lost loved ones, we ask that you would come around them and those that are on the road of recovery from surgeries in the past weeks to surgeries that are coming up, would you walk with them in a new and fresh way this morning? Bless us and them on this healing process, Lord. Make us hungry for justice, strengthen our faith, and increase our love for others, especially those that we find it difficult to love. Help us to be the body of Christ that you have called us to be. Amen. And now hear the words of the Lord this morning. Now, 
Concerning how and when the Lord's return will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying, everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the day. We don't belong to the night, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news. And fully carry out the ministry God has given you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like you, I'm, I'm encouraged every Sunday I come and our worship team puts in front of us, um, really in the middle of us, uh, just a time of worship that invites us into that. I, I'm just, it's a privilege and it's an honor to be part of something like that, isn't it? I know that uh, you came to listen, but it's okay if you talk throughout this thing, not to each other, but... November is typically a month where I, um, I just sort of carve that out and I try to have heart-to-heart conversations with um, our church as a family. Um, uh, this, even though this goes out on the internet and all that stuff, this is really a conversation that I'm having with you all, the people in front of me. And, and uh, it's uh, in the office, I get here early on most mornings and I get a chance to pray for so many of you by name, depending on what is happening in your lives at the time, if I know about it, or I pray for us as a whole congregation. And as I pray, I have conversations with God. Um, and in those conversations come themes, come ideas. And um, November is typically a month where I, I just share those things. So this isn't part of a series. It's nothing like that this is just a heart to heart can I have a conversation with you thank you thank you thank you um, I want to start with a phrase from Thomas Merton that I, I read some years ago maybe 15 18 years ago uh, and it it I thought wow that's a powerful statement and the longer I've lived with this phrase the more powerful it has become. I'll tell you why in a moment. In his book, New Seeds of Contemplation, this is what Thomas Merton lived in an abbey or a monastery, but this is what he said. He said, most poets never become poets. For the same reason that most religious people never become saints. They never get around to being the kind of person that is called for by the times in which they lived. Most poets are ordinary poets 
And most religious people are ordinary religious people because they never get around to being the kind of person called for by the times in which they lived. Why that was so powerful to me is two reasons. The first is that it suggests that your calling in life rises as much from your times as it rises from your passions. And that's a big deal. Uh, If I can turn around and write on my imaginary whiteboard right here, that'd be okay. You'll have to imagine or um, hallucinate if you prefer. I am picturing a triangle that looks like this. And at the lower left, I see me or you. And then at the top, I see God. And then down at the lower right, I see the times or the culture. And what Merton suggests is that my calling Uh, starts with a conversation maybe about me. What are my passions? What do I enjoy? What brings me life? What makes my heart sing? What could I just make a living at? But, But there's nothing wrong with those questions, but those questions are all revolving around me. I don't mean they're narcissistic. I just mean they're mostly about me. The other way is to bring in God into that conversation and to say, what is it that God wants me to do? What has God put in my hand, like Moses, so that I can do those things with ease and with purpose? I want to get better at these things. So now my calling in life, which is... uh, For the moment, your calling is not your career. Are we clear? Your career is a way of doing your calling, but your calling is bigger than your career. You use your career to fulfill your calling. The calling is the fire that God has put in your heart. And your career simply becomes a way of practicing that fire. So in the second question, I'm asking myself not only what brings me joy and energy in life, I'm asking myself what does God want me to do and what has God put in my hand? But then when I add this third component, the times or the present culture, you guys, it changes the question significantly. It suggests that my calling rises not simply from a conversation between me and God, but from a conversation with God about the times. So the times that I live in today may require a different kind of person than was needed 20 years ago. As the times change, as my life changes, and the culture changes, different things are needed. So I'm no longer just practicing what makes my heart sing. I'm practicing what God needs in these times. Which raises the second big reason I love that quote. Because he suggests that a saint is not someone who just has great virtue. Or is devoted to God. He says a saint is someone whose life is an answer to the times. You can be a person of virtue and fully devoted to God and never become a saint if your life does not answer the needs of the day. So you can see how this fundamentally changes this whole conversation about what do I want to give my life to? Uh, my father was the, was the last of nine children in his family way back in the day. Second generation from um, come over from the Netherlands. And um, 
Uh, his mother died when he was four. They were a pretty religious family, but his mother died when he was four. And when that happened, the family disintegrated. The father went to work and, and went to alcohol. And so by the time my dad was 15 years old, he died behind the wheel of his truck, drunk. That meant at the age of 15, my father became an orphan. He remembers conversations where the older siblings were trying to decide who'd get to take him or have to take him in. The older siblings had all moved away. They were either married or had found their careers. But there were three women, older sisters, um, Lois, Elaine, and Marlon, who had dreams of going to college and someday having a family of their own. But what they decided to do was to set those dreams aside and put all of their energies back into the family because the family had blown up and they were trying to say, how do we reestablish the religious moorings of a family that has not really been a family for 11 years? Why I tell this is because it represents a whole generation of people 30, 40, 50 years ago who never had the luxury of going to college because life happened in between the time they were a child and the time they would have gone to college. It was either a tragedy in the family or it was war or it was something else. But there's a whole generation of people who pulled off of life and focused on doing the thing in front of them. They, they answered the times. The times had changed. The family had blown up. There had come a war. And they decided to say, my calling at this season of my life is to answer the times that have changed. And what I'm trying to say is that that is an entirely new definition of a saint. A saint is anyone who for the love of God gives themselves fully to answer the times. It is not someone who pulls away from the culture, but someone who enters the culture for the love of God and tries to answer the day. They may not feel like a saint. They are not heroes. They are not monks. They are not crusaders or preachers or advocates. They're nothing you would elevate. But they, 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 they gave themselves to answer the day. That's a new way to think about saints. So it raises the question, and this is why I start here. What time is it? And what kind of people are called for in these times? Now you have to think not just about yourself. You have to think about all of us. And instead of just saying, what does God want me to do or be? You have to ask, what is happening in the culture? Let me pause for a second. If you're in the middle of a career right now or in the middle of a job, one of the most powerful things you could do is to take about two or three hours, pull off of that, spend a little bit of time describing the culture or the day in which you live. Just put down words, describe it. How would you describe in adjectives the times or the day in which we live? And then the second question is, tell us why it is so important in that day for you to do what you are doing with integrity and faithfulness. If you can do that, if you can set your job or your daily work in the context of the current day, because the day is what it is, it is important for the people of God to do what I'm doing. You will find a new engine for the job you already have. You there? It will take time, but I think if you do it in company with a few people, why does the society today need us to be what we are? 
is a huge question. And there is a calling somewhere in that question. So the question now is, what are the times and what kind of person is called for? To that, I went to Thessalonians, and I went to Timothy, and I'll tell you why. Because there's only a couple of places in all of Paul's 13 letters where he talks about last days, end times, end of the world, all that stuff. And Thessalonians is one of them, and Timothy is the other one. And in Thessalonians, the church in Thessalonica were obsessed with last days. They were like some people that you know. They're always looking at the paper to say, ah, this sounds like it's the last day. And Paul writes to this faith community that is obsessed with, are these the last, are we living at the end times? It's like they'd read books by David Jeremiah, Hal Lindsey, whoever it was. And and, and they were just consumed with this. And so Paul mentions the last days several times in 1 Thessalonians. He says, you've turned from idols to serve the living God and you wait now for the coming of his son who will rescue you from wrath in the last day. That's chapter 1, verse 10. It's right there. In chapter 3, he'll say the same thing. I pray that you will be blameless until the coming of the Lord in the last day, in verse 13. Then in chapter 4, Paul gives what is arguably the most concise and clearest picture of what will happen in the last day. He says, in the last day, the Lord himself will descend with a loud shout, with the cry of an archangel with the sound of a trumpet and all who are dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and still remain will be caught up together with them, that is Christ and those who have died in Christ, to be together with them in the air. Some of you are like, that's rapture. And others of you are, that's, there is no rapture. That's second coming. Argue later amongst yourselves. He finishes by saying, encourage one another with these words. There is an end to all time. And at the end of time, Christ himself will come down from heaven with a shout and the sound of a trumpet and the dead will rise, and those who are alive will go with him, and we will live forever with him. Those are encouraging words. But he doesn't stop there. He goes immediately into chapter 5 and goes to the second question. What kind of person is called for in the last day? And his answer comes in a series of metaphors that fall nicely into two categories. One is the category of darkness. He calls night. He calls it sleep. Or he says they are drunk. The other is the category of light. He calls it day. He says they're awake. And says they're sober. And then Paul turns to the church in chapter 5 and verse 4 and says, You do not belong to the darkness. You are children of light. You are children of the day. Not of the night or of the darkness. So he says in verse 6, Let us... Be fully awake and not asleep. And let us be sober. And without even trying, you can see what Paul has done. He has created two moral categories. One is called darkness, night, sleep, and drunkenness. And the other one is called Light, day, awake, alert, and sober. And Paul has told us 
it is important for us to remember who we are and where we came from. Are you still with me? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then God, wait for it, separated the light from the darkness. And the light he called day and the darkness he called night. And the morning and the evening were the first day. Are you there? In the Exodus, in the second creation, the Exodus, when God was creating a new society, people called after his name out of Egypt. It says clearly in Exodus chapter 10 that a plague of darkness swept over Egypt for three days. But in the land where the Israelites lived, it was light. Are you there? So it was darkness for everyone else, but for the people who belong to God, it was still light. And so when Moses put his hands over the sea so the Israelites could walk through, the scripture says in Exodus 14, God lifted the cloud from in front of the Israelites and he put it in between Israel and the Egyptians. And so for the Egyptians, everything was dark. And for the people of God, everything was light. And you start to get the feeling as you read the Old Testament that maybe God is creating two clear categories and he's calling light out of darkness. This is why when we get to the prophets on the eve of exile, Isaiah would say to the people going into exile, to those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. He's speaking of the birth of Jesus Christ. He would say in Isaiah chapter 44, when he comes, he will lead the blind down ways that are unfamiliar to them. And he will turn their darkness into light and make smooth the rough places. At the end of time, the prophet says, those who are the people of God are those who have given themselves to the hungry. They have satisfied the needs of the oppressed. And those people, says the prophet in Isaiah 58, their light will shine in the darkness and their night will become the noonday sun. Are you starting to hear the theme? It's resounding as we get through the Old Testament. God has seen two categories. There is light and there is darkness. And the people that God is forming are people of the light, not people of the darkness. This is why when Jesus is born, John would say, a light has shined in the darkness, but the darkness cannot comprehend it. God sent his son in chapter 3 as the light of the world, but people preferred darkness because their deeds are evil. Jesus would say, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. You will walk in the light of life. Are you still there? you start to hear that God has not only created the light in the darkness, he is calling his people out of darkness into light. This is why Paul would say in Ephesians 5, 8, once you were darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. He will say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, what does light have to do with darkness? Why am I drilling this point on? 
Because I, some of us are children of light, but we play with darkness all the time. We have petty, silly, stupid arguments about whether something is right or wrong or whether it's in one of those gray areas. That, it, that was never the question. The question is not, is it light, darkness, or gray? The question is, does it lead to light? Or does it lead to darkness? There's a lot of things you can do that are legal and fine, but they do not pull you toward light. They tease you with darkness. And you justify it because you can't quit it. There are some who worship with us and everything is light. And then when they go home or they go to work back to the dorm, they are teased with the darkness and you play with it. So it, it is no small thing, church, for Paul to say, if we are living at the end, whether we are or not, you can debate that. It is essential that you live as children of light and not play with darkness. There are others here. You're not in darkness, but there is darkness in you. There are lies, there are misbeliefs, there are things that you think are true. And so you practice what you practice because those behaviors are built on something that is a lie. One of the qualities of darkness is that when you're in it, you can't see where you're going. Job says they grope in the darkness. And Proverbs says they stumble in the darkness and they don't know why. That is, they keep running into things that they can't see. They can't figure out why their life isn't working for them. Why do I always end up in trouble? Why are my horizons always shorter? Why are my options always fewer? Why am I always stuck? They can't understand it because they live, they grope in darkness. I, I, I wish I was I, I wish I was only describing um the world, but I'm not, and, and you know this. So, so one of the questions, church, that we, the church, have to wrestle with is, are we playing with darkness, or is there darkness still in us that holds us bondage, captive to things? Are you still there? I'm going to land this in a minute. Hang on. It gets better. Darkness and light, night and day, are for Paul not just moral categories. If I had a better word, I would use it, but I don't. I took a theology class and it wrecked my vocabulary. It, it takes you years to get over that. It these are not just moral categories. Um, these, are, <laughs> these are eschatological categories. Is that clear to everyone? How, <laughs> what, what I mean is darkness and light, night and day, are for Paul not just moral things. They are seasons. They are times. They are periods. They are eras or eons of time. 
Back in Paul's day, what most people miss is they didn't have artificial light. This may surprise you, but they didn't have smartphones. You, I don't know what they did. You, you couldn't pull something out and in a moment's notice, flick a light and dispel the darkness. You couldn't hit a switch and dispel the darkness. All you had was a lantern or a candle and not everybody had those. And so when the sun went down and things got dark, the city streets were dark. Roman cities made little to no effort to try and light their streets. They just let everything in their, in their villages stay pitch dark. So what this meant was when night fell, an entire species of people suddenly appeared came alive at night and they started to do things under the veil of darkness that they would never do in the day. And so at night, people broke into homes. At night, they vandalized graves. At night, they mugged people who were walking through the streets. Juvenal, who is a first century Roman poet, lived at the time of Paul. Juvenal said, if there's any person who goes into the city streets at night without first writing his last will, he's guilty of negligence. Because anything could happen in the city street at night. It became a jungle. It was chaos. It was upheaval. It was crime. It was violence. At night, people caroused. At night, they killed. But every night ended at the rise of dawn. At the first glimmer of the dawn. Have you ever been awake before dawn? This is the second service. You're like, if I was awake before dawn, would I be in the second service? <laughs> you should try it sometime. Only once. But you should try it. Because if you, if you sit in your living room or at it, your office and just sit there in the dark sometime and just just think your thoughts and have your prayers but look outside and you will slowly see this hue of lightness rise in the distance and as it rises something in you rises and you think it's a new day this morning, because it was an hour back, I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning. That is awesome. All I know is I got out of the shower, and I heard my wife in the hall say, it's 3 o'clock. Do you know that? I said, honey, I can't just lay there, because my body was already awake. Some of you are like that. Your body wakes up and you thought this morning, this is the only day in the entire year I get 25 hours. I ain't going to spend it in bed, baby. There is stuff. So you get up early and you start working on the day. Even though it's dark. You know the day is coming. And the longer you wait, you look on the horizon and you see the sun start to rise. And you're already into your third or fourth hour of the day. This is Paul's point. There is a night and there is a day. And the children of the day are those who practice at night what everyone will be doing when it is day. You do not belong to the night. You belong to the day that was inaugurated on Easter morning. While it was still dark, says John, just before dawn, says Luke, there was an earthquake and the stone moved away 
And the Messiah came out to the first day of the week. Says Paul, you belong to the world, to the society, to the order that was started with the Messiah who came alive on Easter Sunday. You do not belong to the thinking, to the order, to the world that is dying. You belong to the world that's still coming. This is why Paul would say to the Romans in chapter 13, verse 11 and 12, your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. Listen to him. He says, the night is far gone. The day is already upon us. Let us therefore put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Do you hear what the apostle is saying to you? You do not belong to the order that used to be. You belong to the world that is still coming. And I'll tell you why that's important. Because many of you feel, as I do, that society has changed so radically in the last 15 to 20 years. I know this makes me sound old. But if you're 20 years old, this is not the world you were born into. There are conversations we're having today about the nature of marriage, about the connection between biology and gender, about the importance of law and order, the importance of free speech for a free society. We are suddenly arguing now whether all ethnicities are created equal. And you used to think, wait a minute, I thought we'd settled that. And now we're going all the way back to those conversations? It feels to me like we're going backwards. We're not going forwards. And when you get inside of religious communities and you express concerns about these things, you sometimes feel like you... Well, you feel like something you're not. Like some person stuck in the last century or some far, far right red hat wearing person. Think, that is not who I am, but this is not the society that I was born into. And it feels to you like you're caught in a riptide. You look up and you see the shore, the things that used to be familiar and taken for granted, but there's a current in society that is pulling you steadily away from it. Only fools. Keep swimming for the shore. The more you resist it, the more you will lose your energy. For nothing, you will not convert the current. It's bigger than you. But you don't necessarily have to fall or succumb to it either. You turn sideways and you swim parallel to the shore, to things that you once took for granted. You don't force them on anyone. You just hold on to them and you swim parallel to the current. And sure enough, currents will change. And as it changes, it'll get calm again. So what feels to you like the end of the world is only the end of the world as you know it. It's the end of your world. It's the end of everything familiar to you. And you must not, says Paul, Lose heart. 
Paul tells Timothy, you must stay awake. Stay alert. You will be tempted to believe what the culture or the current is telling you in the name of being relevant. You must not worry about being relevant. You must say things that are eternal and you will always be relevant. But if you chase relevance, you will become trendy and you will be irrelevant. It's the pursuit of relevance that makes you irrelevant. You must hold on to things that are sound and firm. And when the current passes, you will be relevant. Are you still there? Says Paul, you must endure hardship. You must learn how to do hard things. You must learn how to be criticized, opposed, pushed back against without saying you were bullied. You must learn to discuss, even debate, without making it all personal. And you must do the work of an evangelist. Most of the people that you live with and work with don't know why they do what they do. It works for them, but that's all they know. And what I'm learning is many of them want to have conversations. They really do, spiritual conversations, but they don't know who to have those conversations with because everyone that they talk with is a salesman. And they want to have meaningful conversations with someone who knows God and lives in the light of salvation. You must aggressively and continuously evangelize, says Paul. And finally, you must finish the work that God has given you to do. Now... I say all of this to encourage the people of God. The feeling that you have that things are changing and you don't know where they're going and it feels like this could just be the end of a whole society and there's a lot of fear and speculation about what's coming. All of these things are normal when the night is dying. And the dawn is still coming. You must live faithfully as children of light at the break of dawn. What time is it? It is dark, but it's just before dawn. What kind of person is called for by these times? A person who lives ahead towards the day that is coming. And does not complain about the night and all that it has taken away. You are the people, church, that God has separated from the darkness. You are the ones living in the light while the world is shrouded in darkness. You are the ones who give yourselves to the hungry, who care for the oppressed, and so your light, church, is shining in the midst of darkness. And the night is becoming like the noonday sun for you. You are the people of God. You are children of the day. Father, for our church for the people that you have brought into this fellowship community, I pray that you would give us the courage to live like children of the day, even though it is dark. May our lives, may our witness, 
May our disposition be one of confidence, one of hope and optimism. May our lives show that things truly are getting better, not worse, and that they are going exactly to the place where you have brought them. And may you put around us people in darkness who need that powerful testimony. For the sake of your name, we, people of God, pray. Amen. Church, would you stand and let's respond to God together. Oh, Holy Father, giver of all things, you speak and life springs from the Hear these words as we go from this place. The Spirit of God is on you and has anointed you. You are the salt of the earth and you bring light to the world. You are not too young or too old. You are not too rich or too needy to bring good news to the impoverished, to give a hand to the brokenhearted, and to live out freedom and pardon through the gifts you have been given. So remember to pack peace in your toolbox, hope in your briefcase, love in your lunchbox, and may integrity, honesty, and joy be your designer wear clothes. Do not be frightened, for you're never alone. The God who is you are in the image of, made for eternity, will walk with you and guide you into the new day. Go from this place with the peace of God today.